pleasure for me to once again introduce to you uh, Christina Edström, Professor Christina Edström from Uppsala University. And if there is anybody in Europe who knows where the battery research is, uh, is heading, it's Christina leading Battery 2030 Plus. And uh, now we look for, very much forward to hear your talk about the future battery need, the new and more efficient materials. Thank you very much uh, for these very kind words and the high expectations you put on me and my shoulders. Um, as Alexander said earlier, I am the coordinator of Battery 2030 Plus and Battery 2030 Plus had the ambition to become a flagship just like the Graphene flagship. It was just that the commission uh, in the swap from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe, decided to uh, drop uh, the flagships. Instead, they still take care of us, they still cuddle us, and they call us a large-scale research initiative. And I would be very happy to have my slides coming up now. Oh, I can control the screen. That's how it is. I am the master of these slides. Sorry. <laughs> Which meant that I dropped out completely. Can you help me, Luciana, to get into this again? Or should I just share my own screen with my own presentation? Christina, could you please share your own screen? Oh, I should share my own screen. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Then I will do that. And here it is. <coughs> so now we are in business. So I, I, I'm leader of the Angstrom Advanced Battery Center. We are around 80 people. And with the satellites we have at Uppsala University, we are around 100 people. And uh, we are engaged in many of the different important networks like uh, Alist or ERI. And we have a very nice new collaboration with our friends from Chalmers, Partick and Alex in something called Batches Sweden and also in a Swedish Electromobility Center. I would like to give a more of a perspective um, presentation than perhaps uh, going into my own research in detail um, because I think yeah, there are many things that we already discussed when the Questions were put to the chairs about the needs for the future and wh what are we expecting and so on. And I will give you some examples on why I think it's important to really be careful with how you read publications and how you judge uh, science. But first, there's an extremely large interest for batteries in Europe currently. And that's because we are going... Uh, to what we're calling Europe the Green Deal. Your European Commission has said that Europe should be the first climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. And right now, because we are sort of hoping that we are leaving the virus behind us and can start opening up again, we are going towards something called the green recovery. And the expectations for uh, Electric vehicles and batteries are just huge and uh, it, it's increasing rapidly. And it's mainly the uh, electromobility driving this, but also some large scale storage. And of course, batteries need to be improved also for other applications like medical area and, and uh, portable electronics, etc. And if you look at the European demand, this is data I've taken from Inno Energy. Uh, and you can see that Europe is the orange uh, line here. We have a large increase in Europe, but globally it's growing even more. I mean, we have today 1 billion cars globally. And if they all will become all electric, we will need a lot of battery cells. And I think this has become an, a problem and an issue for a European Commission, that if we want to transfer the mobility sector and get rid of carbon dioxide emissions as well as particles and other kinds of, of, of emissions that we are facing, like smog and so on. Um, will Europe, who will be a rather small player than globally, have enough of battery cells to really 
allow our own industry to grow the, and, and transform the way they need. So that's why Europe is putting a lot of efforts in something called European Battery Alliance, which is the industry, in IPSES, which are really collaboration to really make production and, and, uh, and so on for the industry in, uh, in Europe, but also in research. And exactly today when we are speaking here, there are discussions about the battery, a battery partnership where money for battery research will be channeled. So it's a lot going on in Europe and, and it's political interest at high level. And you can say that these numbers already when they were sort of put up, they are already, it's going quicker than we, th we think. So the need for materials are, uh, really um, important and in amount of raw materials, recycling, the whole value chain going from mining all the way to materials production, to cell production, to selling to applications, from applications to second life and to recycling. And if we look at the batteries we have, the rechargeable batteries we have and look at the history of it, it's it, uh, the lithium ion uh, and the nickel metal hydride uh, batteries, they came on the market 1990. And it, you know, the Nobel Prize was given to the batteries last year. And you can see that um, there are a little bit different kinds of lithium batteries. And what we need to do in the future is of course to improve this a lot. And if you look at the system level uh, and you want to have the double capacity in the battery, means that you, the material such must be uh, give you even higher performances and the performances are not just one thing it's cost it's safety it's lifetime and and it's of course sustainability and um, and that paired with that the, the applications and such must be handled and be made in simple and carbon dioxide emission almost free processes. It's really a huge challenge with the whole value chain. So I will just go into the lithium ion battery a little bit more in detail because it's still so that you think it's the mature battery is the one we see in the electric vehicles now, but there are still a lot of improvements to be done. And the European Commission expects a number of new generations to come. And if you look at the typical one, it's, it's based on intercalation chemistries and that's why the the it came historically so late uh, that it's uh, became um, sort of commercial 1990 uh, all the other earlier batteries were more like uh, 19th century invasions innovations and what you have is that you have a negative electrode mainly of, of graphite and it's this that you want to improve and high, uh, get a higher capacity by including silicon instead. And I will come back to that. And then you have a positive electrode of some lithium containing material. And it could be cobalt oxide, iron, manganese, or a, a mixture of nickel and cobalt aluminium. If you look at the big uh, battery producers today, they mainly make the lithium iron phosphate for the Chinese market, for the buses. In Europe, we want to have mixtures of nickel, cobalt, and um, manganese. And um, to this is, of course, important electrolytes. But what is important to remember, and why we do see new generations coming, that is that you have, we have, um, it's a family of different chemistries. It's really a lot to choose between. And, uh, oh, sorry. And if you uh, think of that we are here now with the graphite and you look at the capacity for the cathode, the graphite has still a capacity which is much higher than most of the cathode materials. So when we go for much higher capacity, negative electrodes, anodes, like silicon, which has really a huge difference in capacity, we will can perhaps gain 20 to 30% more capacity of the total cell because we have to balance the uh, cathode versus the anode. If this is, has a very high capacity, we have to make a very thin electrode. 
here and a very thick one here. And this is sort of some of the issues we have to play with. So if you should look at the science, what's, what most people work on in the field of lithium batteries is to really improve the cathode because that means you can press it up to a higher potential or you can press it to higher energy content. That is the bottleneck for the lithium battery. And of course, you will win a lot if you take lithium, uh, because then you can go for uh, non-lithium containing cathodes, which can actually house more of the lithium ions in their atomic structure, intercalate them. So this is a little bit battery crash course for you. So if we look at the coming generations and what we are looking for, it's mainly based on nickel, manganese, cobalt. And some people will say, Oh, uh -huh, cobalt, yeah, that's, that's an issue because cobalt is uh, uh, actually one of the metals that, yeah, you find in Congo and some few other places. The increase in the interest in batteries has made it, this, this try, the attempt to find new sources for cobalt, um, very, it's a, a very interesting movement. And, and we are finding more of lithium mines, cobalt mines, vanadium mines, etc. in Europe. But no one wants to have a mine in their backyard. And so it's an ethical question if we should have something. But you can see it's really so that uh, one tries to reduce the amount of cobalt. N stands for nick uh, nickel, M for manganese, and C for cobalt in this case. And eight is eight, one, one composition. And then we can increase the capacity by also including silicon in the carbon. And, but still we have a limitation in what we can have as volumetric capacity and gravimetric capacity. And Patrick Johansson said in his uh, answer to the questions that we want to avoid hypes and many hypes are actually giving dates on, on uh, and figures about the capacity, gravimetric capacity, uh, discussing systems that, that have very low volumetric capacity. And for many of the applications, the volumetric capacity is the important thing. And of course, if we should reach even higher capacities, we have to go to solid state uh, lithium-based batteries to have the lithium metal and, and not have a liquid uh, electrolytes at all. That's very important. So um, Alex, in his answer, said that the batteries actually are moving towards, towards higher rates. So the gap between the super cup and the battery is coming closer and closer. And this is indeed true. But when you do that, you lose a lot of the uh, specific energy you can store because there's no time to fill the graphite or the nickel cobalt of manganese oxide with the, the lithium ions they have to be running back and forth in the electrolyte but that is important and many of the two-dimensional materials can actually I think support this by by moving um, the capacity you can find for higher uh, with higher storage capacity because you can build new structures that will allow uh, faster transport. And I think for me, graphene and other two-dimensional materials, yes, they are additives, electron conducting additives, that they are actually more than that. And this is something I found from a paper um, where you have a different graphene showing how good they are, can be as capacitors, but also how they can help rather new type of chemistries, lithium sulfur and lithium air, to actually get up their power density uh, and still have a quite high uh, energy density. So carbon materials, graphite, negative electrode, hard carbons, negative electrode for sodium, carbon black electron conducting additives and carbon nanotubes. Yeah, we talked about that in the previous lecture. You can actually build new fun structures of them having oxides that you can sort of grow on these nanotubes and make really nice 
the three-dimensional electrodes that can help you with the power. You can also work on three-dimensional carbon networks uh, as also sort of um, housing different oxides and uh, battery materials, and you have the graphene and graphene oxide, of course. And the classical composite electrode consists of about 80% of the active graphene, graphite particles, and then you have uh, some kind of binder, and you, you have it coated on a current collector. And this nanowiring is so important for the transport properties of the electrons. And some of the uh, electrode materials we have, like lithium iron phosphate, for instance, has a very bad electronic conductivity. And here, graph graphene can really be a support to increase that. And it can also help to avoid chem chemical gradients and so on. But that has also to do with the porosity of the electrode and the wetting of the electrolyte, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So something that can look rather simple is actually a lot of complex engineering to make really good electrode. And one of the problems that I think is really important to discuss when it comes to graphene and graphite and electron materials are the surface reactions between the electrode and the electrolyte. And this is a typical graphite where uh, a maximum of one lithium per six carbons and you put in the lithium ions during the discharge and you remove the lithium ions uh, here. You can see there is a huge uh, irreversible capacity loss here. This is a bad graphite. The um, commercial graphites today, they uh, have just a fraction of this irreversible capacity, but it's still there. And uh, you have a huge upbuild of a solid electrolyte interface that contains organic compounds, inorganic compounds, lithium fluoride, etc. And this is the composition and the growth of the lithium fluoride crystals in this sort of interface here is really influencing thermal stability and in the long run the thermal runaway of batteries. So it's something uh, we have to control. And uh, when we then talk about silicon, I think Victoria mentioned that now this is coming out in most spin-off SME companies. And I listened to one in the morning uh, describing uh, some, some uh, important uh, next steps for that company in using silicon and carbon mixtures. Uh, silicon can alloy with lithium and it can give you very high content uh, and it can uh, increase the capacity of the cell, full cell 20 to 30 percent, but you have drawbacks. When the lithium and the silicon alloys, you get a large particle size increase. You get a large volume expansion, which can actually make your electrode crack. And you have to look at then, how can we make maybe an artificial um, SEI to control that expansion? Can we use a sort of a binder system in the electrode to, to handle that? How, how can we utilize the full capacity of silicon and, and not? Do we need to have very uniform uh, particle sizes for the silicon? There are lots of questions. And we started very early to look at very simple model electrolytes to see what is happening on this solid electrolyte interface on this. And this is the standard electrolyte uh, you have normally, well, IPF6 in, in a, uh, organic solvent and using the same organic solvent and having another salt that cannot give the Lewis acid PF5, which is very uh, uh, aggressive, and also HF formation that you have with LIPF6. Uh, you get a really difference in surface composition. Here you see the native uh, oxide on silicon reacting with the lithium, and um, that happens, of course, in both cases and you have um, more and more of a fluorine etching of this native layer of the lithium uh, of the silicon oxide uh, from the beginning, which you don't have with this salt. You see, you increase the uh, silicon composite electrode cycling much better. And then you, 
you have uh, in literature you can find many different examples of other kinds of additives you can put in and you can increase the number of cycles a lot so uh, what we did to really look at graphene not only as an electron con uh, additive to help with the um, conductivity that was one purpose but also see can actually the graphene layers we make from graphene oxide cannot be protecting the silicon particles from this HF etching or not. So we made, took a binder material you typically have when you make a negative electrode, cellulose uh, binder, and you um, connect it to the silicon and you also connect this to the uh, graphene oxide and made a slurry and then we took pollen PVA polyvinyl alcohol and made some uh, mixing and then did some freeze drying and uh, then we could have our our solid material and then he treated that so we really got uh, graphene layers and the silicon particles spread out in this way we could just have the graphene and no extra binder or carbon we could also have a very high weight percent of silicon and we could get a full encapsulation of this silicon. And here you can see it. Uh, you get a very poor structure of this uh, PVA treatment. And uh, you can see here that you have the silicon particles and you have like thin uh, uh, sheets of carbon on top of it. And the th interesting thing is that it seems like it's actually penetrative for uh, the lithium ions, so we could cycle this but we also could see that we could actually get a very very long nice stable cycling and it we also varied the amount of silicon and we could see that a certain composition was very favorable and we could see that the electronic conductivity was good enough to have a rather stable cycling but and I, now I come to one of my uh, hobby horse uh, fixations, and that is that um, we do have a lot of loss during the first cycle. We have SCI formation, but we have also other things going on here. And we do have a slight capacity loss during these thousand cycles here, well, 1200 cycles. Um, but we could make this uh, without any um, current collectors it, and we could have a stable matrix that were not brittle so we can roll it and we could bend it and we could show that you can cycle it in different ways. So that was good. It was also another sort of benefit from this study. But if you now look at the literature I, and I picked some examples uh, from the, the literature of silicon cycling as anodes with lithium uh, just from the few last months and here you, uh, you can see that they all show this problematic loss during the first cycles they show some really nice cycles to 200 150 50 cycles etc just like we had in our examples and i think this is really important when you judge results because I could also see fantastic results where they didn't really show the starting point. It looks like it's just a flat beginning and I'm not so sure it works that well. Because what you really need to do to show that a um, silicon um, uh, electrode is working versus uh, a, a, uh, is, is to put it in a full cell. The other ones were cycle versus lithium where you have an excess of lithium. And this is an example versus lithium ion phosphate, just to take a standard electrode. And then you see, we don't come up with 1200 cycles. I think the company showed their best results this morning, had 250 cycles uh, before it really b became problematic. So this making the full cell, there, there you can really see if, if your silicon electrode can work. I, I must say that I think the um, the conclusion from this study is that uh, uh, we are on the right way. I think you will be seeing more and more silicon incorporated into graphite or graphene electrodes. 
and I think though that we have to also help the not only working on the silicon electrode as such, but we need to look at the electrolyte, we need to look at the binders we use, and it turns out that even rheology, how you mix things, and the size of the particles is also very important. And here's just a new study from us where we can show that for an NMC silicon graph, graphite also with graphene in it, uh, we have actually quite good cycling if we remove the um, fluorine type of electrolyte. And uh, yes, I see that I love to speak about science, but I will now be very quickly going into a little bit what we think about tomorrow. And we had that discussion earlier too, and, and Vittorio said he thought lithium and sulfur would come soon. And I think the solid state will come from, because there's so much more activity on that, though it's, it's a tough situation to, to handle it. I think that will come before the lithium sulfur. I think you will even closer in time see the next generation lithium ion batteries. I think you will see the sodium ion batteries and the redox flow batteries. And then you have future batteries where I hope that graphene research and two-dimensional materials as such can play an important role for metal air uh, the, and the uh, multivalent uh, battery systems as well as the metal sulfur systems. But that is something we can debate later if I'm right or I'm wrong. Um, I was going to show you some more examples on uh, the use of graphene for new chemistries and for one of the ones that came like a hype, I would say, everyone jumped on it. Uh, but today I think everyone is skeptical and it's the lithium oxygen battery. And uh, that is something that at least I put a lot in the future because it, but it's a fantastic, fantastic system to work on if you're a scientist because everything reacts with everything. And to try to get some little step towards better understanding of the mechanism and find new methods to really look at this is something that every, all battery research has really benefited from. And um, it's really a simple system. You have a lithium negative electrode, you have oxygen and you let the reaction take place and the reaction product, the lithium peroxide, and then when you charge your battery, you should uh, split this back to oxygen and lithium. And it's complex reaction mechanism. Uh, if you have it, uh, these uh, reaction products formed on the uh, carbon surface, because it's mainly carbon, which is the uh, positive electrode, and then graphene, which is much more corrosion stable than other carbons, being very beneficial. So, um, uh, uh, what we have done is to use a aluminium foil, a foam and then put a graphene oxide solution on that and main graphene fluoride and, and see if we can have this graphene embedded in the uh, aluminium foil to, um, to really get a good sort of three-dimensional structure for this. And I think three-dimensional structures in general are very interesting future for, for many applications. And when you look at cycling of, of this, uh, when it comes using different uh, currents, uh, a slow current, faster and faster, and also when it comes to the cycling, you still have the same problems though that you have for typically for lithium oxygen batteries. You do have a large resistance between discharge and charge and you have a problem cycling it for a long time but in fact by using graphene we could increase the stability of the system a lot so i do think um uh, we have more to to see in this area and learn also from the future batteries incorporating graphene and, and of course, when it comes to the lithium oxygen, we have the discussion, do we have this or nanoparticles of lithium peroxide? We know that water plays a role. We also know that we can use redox mediator to sort of bring the electrolyte uh, out in uh, the reaction products into the electrolyte to sort of generate more of reduction product. We know it's 
tough to do the, um, the charging, uh, but uh, we at least know that graphene has increased the stability a lot compared to carbon black. So I, I, showed, um, I showed this plot here where you had the different future chemistries. I didn't tell you really how much better they would be. But if you look at the lithium oxygen I talked about and why that's interesting, I think today when we look at the, uh, at least the few cycles uh, we can make, uh, the capacity is rather low uh, in terms of both what hour per kilogram and uh, the vol volumetric capacity here. But um, I think, and it's even lower than the already existing lithium ion, um, but there is a potential, theoretical potential to, pu to push that up. You can say that the already mature chemistries here, they have solid lines. And I think the sodium ion will come rather soon. And there are companies coming out there also with products and they are growing uh, their capacities into more and more overlap with the lithium ions. I think that uh, that is a promising for many applications, though maybe not for transportation. And then you have the, the uh, divalent ions uh, and you have the lithium sulfur and the organic batteries. And it's, it's actually, if you look at this and you will see that the lithium ion can grow a little bit more if we get the new generations uh, coming, it's quite competitive still. So a lot of the hope lies with the solid state, especially with lithium metal. And uh, therefore it's such a big emphasis on this chemistry to work on that uh, in, in, the, in the field today. And um, that brings me to what, what should we do to really uh, speed up to have these other chemistries and uh, to have them for different kinds of applications, large case storage, medical, um, whatever we can think of where we can need energy storage. Well, battery 2030 plus, um, coming back to that where I started, we decided to take a chemistry neutral approach. This means that we go more for transformational research. We want to accelerate the discovery of materials and interfaces. We call that big map. And I think it was nice to hear both Patrick and Vittorio answered the questions in the beginning. What kind of, of uh, measures do we need to do to really take the next step? And I think it's exactly, we need to uh, do better um, modeling algorithms. We need to take care of all the data we generate and use artificial intelligence for learning more and also use the, the facilities of synchrotrons and neutrons we have in Europe to really make high throughput experiments and more, do that in a close uh, sort of a, um, circuit uh, and, uh, and uh, to really keep this together. And we need to also make the batteries smarter in different ways uh, to, to sort of probe what's really going on there and everything we need to do to speed up things. Then we have to have the manufacturing thinking and the recyclability thinking for the, at the same time from the start and not coming as a later question. I think there's a lot more there to do. And I think by doing that, we can look at, we can already have the future battery chemistries maybe earlier than uh, by traditional methods. So, I really would like to, to, um, to thank you. And I also would really like to thank Yari, Kiran, and the whole Graphene flagship team, because you have helped me a lot and given me a lot of inspiration and ideas how to put together and run and manage a, a large scale research initiative, because it's not trivial to have all, all your <laughs> friends with you and um, and really to make uh, a difference. It's very inspiring to see all the achievements you have done. And we have just in Battery 2030 Plus now finalized our, um, our starting phase 
and with the first sort of one year uh, of putting all this together and from 1st of September I can now tell you that we are going to start the next phase where we actually will run projects in, in this uh, area. We will have a big project uh, map project, we will have uh, censoring projects, self-healing projects etc running and uh, so uh, thank you so much and thank you the graphene uh, team graphene flagship team you are actually doing a fantastic job i really really like to be connected to you and you can also read our um, our um, roadmap on our web page so thank you very much, Crispina, for a fantastic talk and, and really giving us the insight, uh, both in the chemistry of batteries, but also now in the last part for the future. It's really valuable for all of us. Uh, so, so we have a lot of questions for the audience and uh, we will not uh, be able to take uh, all of them. But, but let's take one, which is always central when we deal with graphene. And that's, uh, you, you showed very nice results on graphene encapsulation of silicon. But what about production of this? Scaling up costs. What, what do you see there? <laughs> yes, I see that the route that we had taken is probably not the future route. Uh, but I see also that we have, uh, and I'm very happy to tell that in the Swedish Battery Center, we have a small SME coming up with new ideas how you can make solution based uh, graphene where you could actually find new ways of doing the production much simpler. And uh, that would, of course, lower the cost. Uh, and then we have also the question of the quality of the silicon particles as such, and how uniform the particles need to be to really make a good product. Pro product. And I know also that this is a holy grail for at least five running uh, EU projects, the COFPAT, the COPRA, the HYDRA, the ECOTULIB, and I think I forgot someone in this list. Uh, so it, it's really holy great to try to find uh, simple and uh, low cost ways of doing this. But I think we are moving on in that direction. So speaking of holy grails, I mean, one holy grail, which I think you touched upon was, was really using lithium metal. And uh, we have questions there pointing to the really serious problem of lithium dendrites. So wh what's your view on this? And do you see a role of graphene in, in moderating this as well? Have you seen anything, any initiatives in this direction? I, I think there has been a very interesting attempts, especially about my, my co from my colleague Roberto Minko in, in Slovenia, that he has tried to do that and try to protect the, the uh, lithium metal. Uh, I think you, we are focusing on that problem now and we've done that for so long. So I think there is definitely room to do a lot more and maybe combine it. You have done yourself, Alex, some really nice studies using ionic liquids uh, as sort of a, uh, an interface to uh, the ceramic electrodes because the ceramic electrodes, they also tend to be brittle so the dendrites can sort of go through them. So I think uh, this is an area where we also need to focus a lot of attention. I think one of the new, new actually Battery 2030 plus projects will be very much focused on this and uh, with different new approaches. I can't tell more because I have to sign the grant agreement first. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Christina. And I better not tell all your secrets at once to us. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh.